Hello, I'm Frank Skinner and welcome to Room 101, the show where three guests battle to get the things they hate entombed for all eternity in the dreaded vault. Let's let off some steam, shall we? Welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 10 hilarious rants on Room 101. You shouldn't wake up after a camping experience in a bed. You should wake up with grass stains on your knees in a sense that you can never look your best friend in the eye ever again. Before we begin, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe for more great content. For this list, we're looking at the show's most recent rants from the Frank Skinner era starting in 2012. What kind of people wind up Rachel Riley? <laughs> Rachel, you've gone too far this time. <laughs> Number 10, Dave Myers on Deal or No Deal. Deal? Oh, no deal. <laughs> when he's not busy cooking or out on the open road, there's nothing this hairy biker loves more than grumbling about the cosmic ordering, Noel Edmonds and his banal box opening game show. It's, it's like a game show that's completely and utterly pointless and devoid of skill. Myers mounts his attack on Edmonds' supposed psychic abilities before switching attention to the show itself and questioning its entire concept. However, the chef does admit to becoming hooked himself, so maybe that's why he hates it. It's just not Countdown. Dictionary corner, the sums, Rachel Riley, it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, Frankie Boyle on celebrity atheists. So I am an atheist, mm. but I don't like celebrity atheists. I was a very bad Catholic, unless you include my attitude to condoms, in which case <laughs> I was an amazing Catholic. <laughs> Despite being an atheist himself, Frankie pulls no punches when it comes to slating the rich and famous who pile their beliefs upon us and the judgmental way in which they usually do it. Frankie's case in point, Ricky Gervais. I don't need Ricky Gervais to tell me that God doesn't exist when I watch Derek get recommissioned twice. Calling atheism all a bit religious and maintaining an ominously calm disposition throughout his argument, he's preaching about preaching, and it's fantastic. Religion causes violence. Okay, some, some violence is caused by religion, some violence is caused by lager. And when you can back your opinions up with KFC, even better. But at, at the moment when you go, I'm blaming that on God, that's like you don't get any mayonnaise in your chicken zinger and you blame it on Colonel Sanders. Number eight, Jason Manford on people in lifts. That's why I'm up. I don't know what it is. Giving the Brits bristly reputation for keeping ourselves to ourselves, it's no surprise this next topic was particularly popular with the audience. And Jason's tirade really riles Frank Skinner too. This is a, this is a, a safety instructions diagram uh, warning people about, and it's a genuine thing, for taking a wheelie bin into a lift. Manford outlines his irritation with two key points, both of which are probably fair. Why do strangers in lifts suddenly speak to each other? And why does someone always hog the buttons? He gets nearest the buttons and he goes, what floor? And you go, you're not in charge of the lift. Why have you? <laughs> The whole thing gets Frank thinking of Pelican Crossings for more impassioned, observational thoughts. I tell you the ones that get me, when you're waiting to cross the road and you're at a, a Pelican Crossing and you've been there for ages yeah. and someone comes and presses the button, even though it's got white lit up and you've clear, like you're too stupid. Number seven, Robert Webb on Jeremy Kyle. Um, this is a show where lots of uh, very angry, very upset, uh, rather stupid, I mean, you know, by definition, idiotic uh, people. Sci-fi um, fans. Uh, not, not always sci-fi fans burn, and I think you should let that go. This daytime TV king is as divisive as they come. Providing a shouty soundtrack to many a sick day, Jez is a love or hate him figure, and Robert Webb definitely hates him. And they're helped through this process by a presenter with the heart and soul and voice of a Dalek. Um, <laughs> and it's a bear pit, it's disgusting. Um, uh, I hate it. Webb draws cheers from the crowd with his savage deconstruction of Kyle and his show, before wheeling out some words where to hammer home his point. That best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. And there are lots of things in popular culture that fall well short of that, but I think it's the Jeremy Kyle show that is most strenuously trying to pull us away from it. It's poetic justice and then some, dealt by a comedian whose contempt for his topic is perfectly palpable. So I'm going to put the Jeremy Kyle oh, show right. into quite Room right. 101. <laughs> Number six, Greg Davies on people who give their dogs specific instructions. <laughs> I just think, 
A dog, a dog is a, of limited intelligence. It's well established, and you, there's an argument about whether they're sentient beings or not, whether they have any awareness of self. To a rather bizarre and very specific choice of subject, but one that gets Greg Davies seething in seconds. Coco doesn't know he's in a bush. <laughs> There's no concept of what a bush is. Tapping into the no-nonsense traits of his in-betweeners character, Mr. Gilbert, Davies targets enthusiastic dog owners and their common tendency to overestimate their pet's intelligence. Coco is now has some concept of ownership. <laughs> and by the end of his pitch, Greg's glorious irritation shifts to general parenting and over-explaining things to kids. When this guy's on a rant, there's just no stopping him. I've heard mothers in West London talking to two-year-olds going, no, 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 don't play with that bowl because you're going to spill food on the floor and someone's going to have to come and clean that up. And the toddler's going, I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number five, Chris Packham on Chris Moyles. It is the odious Ooh. Chris Moyles. It's Chris on Chris as naturalist Packham aims to banish this one-time Radio 1 DJ into the fiery pits of Room 101. And Packham's loathing is very obviously genuine. Firstly... <laughs> Hold on a minute. To me, he's a, t <laughs> a totemic figure for the celebration of mediocrity and ignorance. Comparing Moyles to a skin complaint and targeting his perceived lack of talent, Packham produces a well thought out and truly inspired rant, much to the delight of rock god Alice Cooper. Gotta One allow him the odd slip. Badly damaged marmoset. You know, typing on a speak and spell machine would produce his average show. Rounding his ruthless rhetoric off by referencing damaged marmosets, it's safe to say Packham and Moyles will never be mates. I see him as a sort of cheeky jabber the hot. <laughs> Number four, Diane Morgan on Magicians. What is winding up Diane? <laughs> Magicians. <laughs> Known for her moments of wonder on Charlie Brooker's weekly wipe, Morgan employs a typically deadpan style to mercilessly lay into the magic circle, for another subject met with popular approval by the studio audience. I think they're quite needy people, <laughs> generally. Uh, whenever I watch them, I, I'm never entertained. For Morgan, magicians are flat out boring, and she has a few choice words to say about how it all starts and why it's such a problem. I think it starts with parents giving kids magic sets. Because if you give a kid a magic set, that's like a starter kit for a psychopath, isn't it? It'd take way more than a rabbit from a hat to convince her otherwise, clearly. I just can't find any enthusiasm for it. <laughs> Number three, Lee Mack on Top Gear. <laughs> Top Gear may be one of the BBC's flagship programmes, but Lee Mack's mighty miffed with all aspects of the motoring show. And once again, the audience seems more than supportive of his stance. Let's Put this to bed straight away. I'm speaking on behalf of everyone in the world when I say cars are boring. Max quest to exile Clarks and Hammond and May and their love for all things four wheels into the dreaded vault generally focuses on how pointless and impractical he thinks all the car talk is. You'll hear them say things like, you know, if I talked about the new suspension on the Audi 6149, you'd say, but what about the torque? And I go, no, I wouldn't. I'd say, I'd say, where's the cup holder? Whatever your opinion on these three car enthusiasts, it's hard not to be taken in by Mac's argument. Here's the thing. This is a picture of Jeremy Clarkson in a small car. Now, that... <laughs> <coughs> That's funny. Number two, Victoria Corrin Mitchell on James Bond. Oh, the crowd. <laughs> You see, people are going, ooh, like, you don't all know that he's a terrible wazzock. A worthy, ranty runner-up, if ever we've heard one, Victoria Corrin Mitchell goes all guns blazing into quite a controversial pick, backing her points with some brilliant British insults. There's one way he jumps over a cliff with a parachute featuring a giant Union flag, mm. revealing that he's failed to grasp the basic principles of international espionage. <laughs> yeah. She highlights some of Bond's more serious flaws as a supposed super spy, especially his hilarious lack of subtlety, as well as questioning his methods of escape. Skyfall, he can't even keep one old lady safe, which is not surprising, because his big escape plan is to get away from the helicopters by running across a pitch black moor with a lantern. There had been an audible bristle in the audience when she rounded on 007, but by the end of her pitch, we're shaken, stared, and pretty convinced. He manages to combine, uniquely I think, violence and sexism with a sort of weird camp fussiness about everything he eats and drinks and does, and yet, women are supposed to find him irresistible because he has special pens. Number one, James A. Caster on the song Living on a Prayer. I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to split people, but uh, it's part of the reason I hate it. 
There's loads of songs I don't like. It's fine. But I'm going to hear that song for the rest of my life until I'm dead. We've all been someplace somewhere when this cheesy 80s headbanger is belting out the speakers as a supposedly surefire crowd pleaser. Well, it's not for everyone, and James A. Caster hates it with a passion. You don't, none of you love it. It's no one's favourite song. We've all been brainwashed into going along with living on a prayer when it comes on, and there's everyone just, eh, it's, all, it's so bad. Oh, man, I hate it. Just put it in now. Just put it in now. I hate it so much. From calling the audience a bunch of idiots to comparing the song to a motorway accident, his frustration knows no bounds. Yeah, I'll go along with Heston. It's as bad as an accident on a motorway. <laughs> so much so that it reminds Frank Skinner of just how much he hates it too, leading him to pull the lever and expel it for good. Job done. So, although it's a bit eccentric, I am going to put the song Living on a Prayer into Room 101. Do you agree with our picks? Check out these other great clips from Watch Mojo UK and subscribe for more great content.